Welcome everybody again to another one of our Greece 200 uh, Bicentennial panels. Uh, tonight is a very interesting topic in honor of Women's History Month. We'll be discussing the significance of women in the Greek Revolution. Uh, today, as always, we are co-sponsored by the Greece 200 and Sons of Pericles, and we have with us our co-host uh, this evening are the Maids of Athena of District 6, New York. Uh, we're happy to have them and our panelists today include Markella Roros, who is a past chapter president of Brooklyn Maids of Athena. She's currently working as a first grade in-person teacher, and she's pursuing a dual certification master's in general and special education. Uh, as you can see by our backgrounds, both of our panelists have asked me to say that they are, their families are from the island of Chios, and they are very proud of that. Uh, our other panelist, who is uh, also from the island of Cyprus, is Katarina Hajipavlis, current member of the Bayside Maids of Athena. Uh, she's completing her last semester of undergrad working at a bachelor's in communications and media studies. Welcome to you both. We're very excited to have you tonight. Thank you, Paul. We're and very excited to be here. So I think we'll kick it off uh, with, you know, what we wanted to do, obviously, it's a very important topic, very, cannot be talked about enough. Um, and what we wanted to do is kind of start off with laying the groundwork for what the environment was like for women in the 19th century in Greece, what the culture was like, what society um, kind of regulated for them and how feminism kind of arose throughout the Greek revolution. And so I was wondering if you guys could talk about kind of the role of women before the revolution and then take us into uh, how it might've changed during the revolutionary period. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so with pre-revolutionary status, you know, access to education was very limited, limited to especially those of the uh, aristocratic and the merchant class. And that was limited to everybody else. So not only was it limited to those of a lower class level, but women especially, even those in those higher up uh, classes. And culture was traditionally in the sense of the ideal strong and educated woman. But then here we had that she had to be a good wife and a good mother and her job was to manage in the household. So it's, it sounds like everything was, I mean, you know, as we know, it, it was very traditional, very, very conservative in the ways that, that we kind of know already that Greek culture was, and many Western cultures were at the time, um, kind of this traditional sense of what it meant to be a woman, woman at that time. Um, and kind of rolling into the Greek revolution as what we know from last month's panel and a couple ones before that, that the Greek revolution really was an enlightenment period for Greece, right? It was, it was kind of what's been termed a neo-Hellenic enlightenment, trying to restore Hellenic ideals, values, uh, education, and culture. What, did, what effect did that have on women in that time, given their, their current status pre-revolution? Well, women's role, as we said, was the Nikokira, it was to, to keep the household coming. So in terms of intellect, it didn't matter in any way besides the household. So we start to see a lot of women start to force their way in to the revolution and to have a position in that. And I mean, one, one person that we've talked about in particular is Alamatios Koreas and his role in education. Uh, but what seems interesting kind of to me when I was reading about it is that despite his role in education, it was very much education for men though, something that um, obviously it was a contradiction from what was being promoted uh, versus what was being practiced. And I believe he was, he was quoted at the time as saying that education was important for women also, but for the purposes, as you said, Katharina, of kind of being a good, good housewife and being, you know, uh, what he was quoted as saying, when kind of teaching values of modesty, because those are things that women are endowed with by nature, better, better more so than, than men. Um, seems like a lot of contradiction there. So you guys, can you guys maybe provide some insight into kind of how those values play, interplayed with each other? No, it's definitely contradiction there because here they were fighting for freedom. You know, that was the whole point of this is that we wanted freedom for our entire nation. And then to have this freedom and then be told, well, you know, not, not really, you don't get everything. You, you know, you're only gonna get some bits of this pie. So you know, freedom for all, all mankind. And, you know, the women were excluded in this. And that's a common theme though with a lot of revolutions that were happening, you know. Um, Greek women 
were such strong forces in the household, it could be that, you know, by giving them this type kind of education it could have been, you know, people were worried what would have happened then if we don't have that maternal figure in the house. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll discuss, of course, individuals that fought in the revolution, but just to kind of finish laying the groundwork, once the revolution was over, what, in your opinion, what kind of rewards or, or lack thereof potentially did women reap from the effect of the revolution? They still didn't have any extra political power. There was no, they did not increase any sort of stance in society after the revolution. Yeah, I mean some of the women that we're going to speak about, they were gifted uh, land and parts and homes in Nafplio, actually two of, um, two of the women that we're going to speak about, and they were given titles, but titles that really didn't hold any political power. So it's like, thank you so much for helping us win this war that we've been fighting for so long. So here's your parting gift, here's a little house, and see you later. Oh, by I the way, you're also broke now. You know, As I was reading and researching, um, I kept seeing the exact sentence that was, uh, was born rich, but died in poverty because she gave everything she had to the revolution. Yeah. You know, and I feel like that's also a part, you know, women are nikokires, right? We were taught, we are loving, nurturing human beings. And for a lot of these women, they took these soldiers, these men under their wings and was like, you know, we need to help. So I'm going to give you the money that you need to go to this place and go help them out. I'm going to give you the money that you need to go back to your family. And it's baffling that, you know, at the end, it's like, thank you. And these, these roles continued after the revolution too, and rebuilding and caring for people who were affected by it. Mm -hmm. It also sort of uh, reminds me of like nowadays, uh, and like in U.S. history, when it comes to veterans, how like vets of the Vietnam War, like were treated coming back, there was no extra help. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's well said, and I mean, I think we bring that up um, not only to discuss what things were like back then and kind of show how how things maybe didn't go as well for everybody as they did for for certain classes, but also to kind of outline the said the true sacrifice that was made right so we're, we're going to be discussing women during the greek revolution that made the ultimate sacrifice in a lot of ways for their country but even more so because what you're saying is they didn't even get the benefit that a lot of other people got so it's an even stronger sacrifice in a lot of ways um so i mean it, it's a good kind of background to lay and with that being with that foundation being laid let's go ahead and get into um some of these notable hellenic heroines that kind of, you know, gave their lives and livelihoods for their country. So first we are going to start off with a woman that I feel as growing up and going to Greek school, we all saw her face. We all knew her name, but we didn't know that much about her. Maybe a paragraph or two in a Greek history book, you know, that was brought over to, you know, New York or most of us, I know most of us went to Greek school was uh, Lascarina Bubulina. And she is often referred to as the first and only, and up until recent history, um, woman to be ever be given the rank of admiral in the Navy. And she is known for her tremendous contribution to the Greek War of Independence in the 19th century. And her story actually, this was very interesting that I found out, is that it begins in Constantinople in a prison where her father was serving a sentence for his actions and participation in the Peloponnesian Revolution in 1769. So he was up there actually serving time fighting against the Ottomans. And there she was born. And I find that, you know, being born in a prison while your father is serving his sentence for fighting for freedom is almost like a family business in this way. Because later on, we actually find out that Lascarina Bubulina fought alongside her firstborn son, you know, later on during this. So after she was born, um, her mother and her went back to her mom's island of, um, of Hydra and then soon moved to Spetsis. And in Spetsis, that's where she grew up. She got married there. She had her seven kids there. And actually there is a museum erected at her home that you can walk through and they teach you about her tremendous life. So both of her husbands, were two uh, sea captains who both happened to die via pirate, you know, those attacks that were happening on the Mediterranean. And after the death of both of her husbands, she was left with a lot of money. And I think it's very 
you know, brave of her. She took this money and instead of keeping it for herself, for her family, she put it in to partner with several other uh, Spetses vessels and then built three of her own ships, one of which was the Agamemnon. And this ship is known for being the largest Greek fighting ship of the Greek War of Independence. It was 33 meters long and armed with 18 heavy cannons, which I think is tremendous. And just even think about that now is like crazy. Um, another thing that happened on the Agamemnon that I think is really interesting is that she raced the first and actually her own flag of the revolution. And this flag is blue and red, blue to symbolize the ocean and the Hellenic spirit and red to symbolize the blood of those that have sacrificed their lives. And in the middle, it is adorned with an eagle. And on one side of the eagle is an anchor to symbolize the Navy. And on the other is a phoenix rising from the ashes, symbolizing the rebirth of the nation they were fighting for from the naval services. So let me see. Um, one big, big battle that I know we've all learned about growing up was the blockade of Nafplio. And it was such a pivotal moment in the Greek War of Independence since Nafplio became uh, Greece's first capital after the War of Independence up until Athens gained the title in 1834. And there's actually a very famous oil painting of Bubulina on her ship. It's like this little rowboat, it almost looks like. And she's going into Nafplio. And when you look at it, it reminded me of uh, Washington crossing the Delaware River. It's got the same look to it. And that's who she looks like. She looks like, you, you know, uh, George Washington. And I'm pretty sure that this oil painting was actually done before the one of Washington. So I think, you know, who took some creative liberties here to do this is very interesting to think that, you know, they were comparing these two individuals for their tremendous bravery and the way that they overconquered their lives to sort of help their own nation. So not only um, as she took part in the blockade of Nafplio and the capture, she also helped the capture of the coastal cities of Pilos and Monevasia. Yeah. Um, and she was also present for the fall uh, of Tripoli in September of 1821. And as we were saying before, she consistently gave her money to help out those who didn't have it, to help out the cause. And speaking of her money and her riches, uh, during the battle for Tripoli, she actually uh, fulfilled a promise that she had that she made back in 1816 to the mother of the Sultan in Constantinople. During that year, she went back to Constantinople and asked the Sultan to protect her riches. You know, this was a common practice because, you know, the Ottomans were coming and they had to do something. She needed that money to help protect her way of life, her family, her brothers, her people. So she went to the Sultan to go ask, and who is more powerful than the Sultan at that time is his mother. And his mother said that they would be happy to protect her riches for a repayment. Now this repayment was not in the form of money, not in the form of, you know, it was in the form of, of, of a service. And the Sultan's mother said, if there's ever a Turkish woman that is asking you for help, you have to help her. That is the only thing that we're asking. And during the massacre of Tripoli, Bubulina was actually able to save the women and the children of the harem of Kuris Pasha during that time. So when Napoleon finally fell to the Greek forces on November 30th of 1822, Bubulina stayed in the city as it was awarded to her. She was given this property, as we spoke about before, as a big thank you. And she actually retired on the island of Spetsis after that. So she stayed there for a few years and then she went back home. You know, that's where she actually, we're going to get into the interesting, interesting part about how she actually passed. Now, this decorated war hero, all right, she was actually killed by a bullet of one of her own. So she was killed by a Spetsis bullet on May 22nd of 1825. 
due to a family confrontation. Her, old, her son eloped with a woman and the woman's family was not too happy about that. So when they came back to the house to demand, give us back our daughter, words were said and a bullet flew and it actually struck her in the head. The man or woman who had killed her has not been uncovered. It was, they say it was a stray bullet and it killed her. Now, I think this was just really interesting because all this time is gone. And again, we've seen her face, you know, we've seen her in the history books, but really going so in depth, you learn about what she gave up for the country that we love so, so much. Um, so there's a lot, a lot, a lot on Bubulina. Um, but there's a lot of other notable women in the revolution that are not as studied in our history books that we grew up with. Um, I looked up a little bit on Manto Mavrojanus. Um, she headed to Mykonos in 1822 when the war hit. So she used her own fortune to equip and man two ships that helped other islands in the Kiklades as well as Mykonos. And she equipped 150 men to Peloponnesos. She sent a lot of financial support to Samos when they were also being threatened by the Ottoman forces. Um, she was known to have built a fleet of ships to help in the massacre of 1822. She did not manage to prevent the massacre of 1822, um, but she did play a significant role in helping them fight it. And at the end of the war, she was awarded the rank of Lieutenant General, which for a woman in this time is so significant. And she was given a home on Nafio, which as Marquela pointed out, was the capital of the new nation at the time. Um, she was, she tried very hard to reach out to women all over Europe, a bunch of Philhellenic societies and organizations to get as much help for the country as she could. And she came from rich, but she did everything she could to help Greece during the, during the revolution and during the war for independence that she ended up dying in poverty um, as well. That seems to be a common theme. And I mean, just as, as we're kind of two, two heroines and two women th through, another interesting thing is both so far are the Ospoto members. I mean, Bubulina, we said, was born in Constantinople. Mafugianus was born in Trieste, Italy. So we're two for two already on something that we've touched on, um, you know, a couple months ago is the role of the Ospoto in the revolution and how this was a true global effort of people not just born and raised in Greece, but people that came back to help their country, reached out to Katrina, as you said, Philhellenic people um, who just, who were supportive of the cause, if not Greek by blood, maybe Greek by heart. And um, we see that even within the women of the revolution. So I think that's a really interesting point that keeps getting brought up over and over again. So Paul, you are 100% correct about this being a global effort. Uh, Bubulina was actually given the rank of Admiral by the Russian Navy. and I didn't even know before doing all this research that Russia was connected to the Greek independence uh, war at all. So it's so crazy to think that not only were, you know, us Greeks who we say, you know, we love this country fighting, but we got, you know, allies and people that I didn't even think were involved during this time. So I think it's really a lot of and how far, you know, the Greek ideas st structured out and reached. A lot of times too, just a common theme in these situations is that the people who are physically there can't get out of it. Um, when I was in Cyprus last summer, a woman was telling us that in 1974, it was the diaspora, it was the people who had gotten out of Cyprus who were saving the people who were there. Um, so it's definitely a common theme in any revolution. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point and maybe a, a little bit of a call to action for our end right even now with some of the things going on. Um, Marquela, you mentioned Russian involvement and, you know, maybe that's something we cover a couple months from now, but that, that was a huge part is, is uh, Britain, France and, and Russia getting involved in the revolution and, you know, who knows what would have, would have happened without them. And one, one note that I think maybe we've brought up before, but deserves repeating is that that was the first time in international relations history that Britain, France and Russia all worked together on something. And we know how that's kind of turned out for international affairs in the last 200 years. So you know, that gets a little bit into the Greek revolution's effect on the future and all of Europe and the West. But 
to, to say that this was a global effort and had global ramifications. Definitely, you know, definitely a little bit off topic, but also incredibly related and incredibly important. So. Um, Evantia Getty was also a very notable, significant woman in the revolution. Um, online, when you research her, it's just the same words to, to describe her, which is Greek educator who was a leading feminist following the liberation of Greece from Turkish rule. Um, she focused heavily on educating young women and not specifically in the way we mentioned before, where educating women was educating them in how to manage a household. She intellectually wanted to educate women and, and help them thrive. Um, she also solicited help for the country through European women's organizations and contributed to the development of a strong Phil Hellenistic movement of, amongst intellectual women. She's actually most well known for a play she wrote called Nikiratos, which focuses on Greek women who had lost their lives during the war. Um, and after the war, she also gave everything she had to running a home for war orphans um, helping the country recover on the island of Andros. And Kat, what I also wanted to mention with uh, Evanthea is that the play that she wrote, she actually published it at first anonymously. And then later on when it came out, this happened to now be, when she published it under her name, the first play ever published by a Greek woman ever. And I was actually trying to find the the play itself and the translation, which I think I found, and I wanna go and take a look back at it because that I think is some beautiful piece of work that should be told, especially like when we think about like Greek school, like educating young Greek women, like look at this, look at what this woman did in a time where it was unheard of. And I think, um, you know, we said earlier, we were a little bit realistic, but also like, it's, it's a negative point, but it's a realistic point that there weren't a lot of benefits to the revolution potentially for, for women, as, as you both said. And yet there's this continued focus on education in, in the true sense, not just in this, in this uh, superficial, super superficial sense. Um, but the, the revolution really provided for an avenue to that education. And one thing that I, I read at least um, in the last couple of days is that even though there were no, there wasn't this tangible benefit of the legal, social, and political rights that really took another hundred years to get after the fact, there was for the first time, at least in Greek culture, and in some ways in a lot of Western cultures tied to their revolutions, this idea that, you know, the role of man and women is not necessarily preordained by nature, but that it's, it's governed by humans, and that means it can change. And so it gives you this, this kind of challenge and opportunity to to change things in all aspects to the way that you want to see things. And I think that's a common theme that we see here in education was one way with which that happened. But I mean, it's something that keeps coming up periodically with, um, you know, Evanthea, Mavrogianus and Bubulina, all of them kind of led to that, that change that they wanted to see in more than one way. Definitely. I I agree 100%. You know, education isn't only, you know, sitting in a classroom and learning, you know, your history. It's more, it's about going out there and living life. And I think that these women took what they learned from these wars and gave back to their community as much as they possibly could. And even when it drowned at them, you know, it, they were, they had nothing left afterwards. So that really says something for the way that they felt about their country and the way that they felt about letting the world know what was happening. Another woman who also wrote plays, um, Elizabeth Mutsan Mar Martinengo, she was from Zakynthos. Uh, she felt very strongly about the fact that as a woman, she could not pick up arms. She could not fight in this war the way her male counterparts were. Um, she was one of the first to really call out the gender roles that were existing. Um, she was self-taught and critical of the exclusion of women from education. And there's actually a direct quote. Upon hearing his words, I felt my blood warm up. I wish deeply in my heart to have been able to gird myself with arms. I wish deeply in my heart to have been able to rush to tender my assistance to a people fighting solely for its religion and homeland. And for that much yearned for freedom, which when put to good uses, brings immortality, glory, and happiness to nations. 
I wished all this in my heart, but then I stared at the walls of the house within which I was being kept secluded. I stared at the long dress as a female subjection and was reminded that I was a woman and what is worse, a woman from Zampi. Um, so yeah, again, from her, from a woman herself during this time, how her role was to be home and she could not help the way she wanted to help uh, in, this, in this revolution. Yeah, and, and Kat, now, and this actually I think is a great segue that when, when it goes to how women can help and then what happens when they, when they can't, right? And when they're there, that actually goes on to the suryotisis. And for a lot of us, we learned about this in Greek school. We learned about it by actually reenacting to a degree what happened on December 16th of 1803. Now, when I hear, and I know that everyone says it, you know, that is the big phrase, the motto that came out of the Greek independence war, which translates to freedom or death. These women took that to heart. So the women of Sulis or modern day um, Zalongo in Epirus, uh, women of this village participated in a mass suicide. They perched themselves up on the cliff and there's actually a cliff that you can visit now. And they believed that a death sentence would be better than being under the enslavement of the Ottoman Empire. And they would take their children, they would hug them in their arms. And as they would perform this dance and jump off the cliff, they would be singing. Now, there is a... Um, part of this song that I think really hits home and really helps you understand where these women were coming from. And if I butcher this, I apologize to everyone who's listening to me. My 11 years of Greek school are really coming in handy now. It's Isuliotisis den mathan yanazune monacha xechnun kenapethenun yamin stergun din sklavia. So this translates to the women of Suli have not only learned how to survive, but they also know how to die, not to tolerate slavery. And I feel like being a woman during this time in that village, it was nothing for them to do. They were in a way, you know, sitting ducks, you know, they, they knew what their fate was going to be. And in this moment, they said, you know what, we're going to take our fate into our hands. And the song that is sung during these Greek school, you know, plays and it's, it puts, it actually stays in your heart. You know, I, I was playing it for my sister and she even said it. She's like, oh my gosh. She goes, I remember doing this in Greek school. And I explained the entire story to her. And it really hit home as, you know, being put in that position. What you wonder, what would you do? You know, would you have the guts to do this, to save your family? With your child. And your child, yeah. It's it's unfathomable to think, you know, being put in that kind of position. And, you know, we think about them all the time, you know, especially going to Greece. And we have to think, you know, and be thankful, not only to those who physically fought in this war for us, because without them, we wouldn't, you know, have, you know, the views behind us would not be ours, would not be something that we can say that we love so deeply in our hearts you know it would be a different world without everyone's participation in this no matter how big or small it might have been it made such a difference and such an impact in our lives today 200 years later i mean, I mean it couldn't be more timely to bring up the sweet he says because i don't know if you guys saw but i mean we're less than a week removed from the actual bicentennial and one of the ways that um we saw people celebrate was a group from the u.s army choir actually saying the dance was out which Whoever hasn't seen the video yet, it was pretty moving. Um, obviously, you know, the lyrics are pretty powerful and indicative of what was happening at that time. Um, one of the first real revolutionary activities against the Ottomans. So significant for multiple reasons. But I mean, definitely it's something that's on a lot of our minds for this last week, at least for, you know, a lot of the time, but specifically this last week. As we also talk about how the last week, um, I think it's important to remember that we celebrate March 25th, but that's just when it began. And we, they, this was a 10 year story. This was 10 years of them fighting. And it wasn't just March 25th and we called it a day. It wasn't just, you know, we, we celebrate that day. This was a 10 year fight 
for independence and 10 years of, to the point where these people were, were ending up at mass suicide and writing plays begging to, to help. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, um, when I travel back to Hios, you know, one of my, I, I hate to say favorite, but one of my favorite parts of going back is going to Namoni and going to the site of this, this, you know, massacre that happened in 1822 and really sitting there and seeing, you know, the skulls that are in the cabinets there and seeing and really thinking back to oh my gosh, like this isn't just a story that we read about in, you know, in Greek school. This isn't just, you know, a date in March that, you know, we talk about how much we love our country and then do something else. This happened to pretty much all of our families. If we really think about it and actually went back into historical records, it could have been someone that we were, that was part of our family that went through this and did it for us. So I think it's really important. I love what you said, Kat. Like we need to really think about how it wasn't just the one and done. This was 10 grueling years after 400, you know, that we really need to sit and be thankful every single year that we get to love this country as much as we do. I think that's well said. I mean, you, you both hit on it, but just as, you know, as always, just to close out then, um, the question we always ask at the end is with this topic, you know, in, in your succinct opinion, what, what is the true significance of it? Why, why did we choose this topic in particular to, to discuss and what are some lessons or modern day influences that we can kind of take from it today? Michael, maybe we'll, go ahead, Katrina, yeah. In 2021 in, in America, we're still, we're still figuring out gender norms and we're still figuring out what, what women's roles are. And there's, there's still, this adjustment happening here where we're more further, we're more progressive. Um, so it's crazy to see that this isn't new. This is, this is 200 years ago that women's, women have been like, we're here, like, let us, let us help. We can do it, which is pretty interesting because we learned about Bubulina in school and we touched on the other women, but I don't think it, it sunk in for any of us really. Oh, I completely agree with that, Kat, 100%. And when I was thinking back to, when I first started this, and I was thinking back to, well, what do I remember from Greek school? I was between the ages of six and 14. And honestly, at that time, I didn't want to learn about all this. I wasn't interested in it. I was being taken out of soccer and birthday parties and this to sit in a classroom and be taught by, you know, a woman who reminded me of my, yeah, yeah. You know, but now as a 25 year old woman, looking back on this, I can say how amazed I am by all of this information, by these women that fought for us and held back, never held back, sorry, never held back on anything. And for me today, I want to make sure that when we talk about notable women in history, these names are brought up whether we are talking to our Greek friends or not, you know, these women need to be mentioned. And not only these women, there are so many women, I feel that throughout history aren't mentioned. And I think we need to bring them back. We need to give them equal playing field. We need to talk about them and recognize the sacrifices that they've made and the differences that they've made in our, in our world today. Without them, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be living the life that we're living. I think it's really important that we acknowledge that and remind everyone about it in one way or another. One, one of the first things we said before we even started speaking was how hard it was to find some information, right? So I think that that's proven out exactly what you're saying on that point, Michaela. Yeah, and I'm so glad that with this panel, when we post it, you know, it's not only going to hit home to us, but people are going to find it and listen to it and maybe do their own research on it. You know, I know that my yaya is going to be watching this in Greece in Hios now. And, you know, maybe she'll think back on some things that she learned about, or maybe she might even learn something new. You know, I think we always have to remember that with education, with history, we don't know everything. You know, and every day we are uncovering new things of our past, our present, our future. So we have to be open-minded to everything and let it happen. 
Yeah, agreed. Um, well, thank you both, Katarina Markella. I think this was a great panel. Thank you both for participating, putting in all the hard work to, to make this happen. Um, to our viewers, as always, thank you for watching. Our next panel is going to be uh, April 14th, hosted by the Hempstead Lord Byron, Sons of Pericles, discussing their namesake, Lord Byron. And uh, be sure to tune in next time. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye.